probably the biggest news about this Supreme Court term was the unusual uh, occurrence of a leak of a draft opinion in the major abortion case. What was your sense of how that impacted the court's work? Well, well, I thought, Mitch, that it's good to be back with you. I thought the biggest uh, news was my moving from Cato to Georgetown, now to the Manhattan Institute, but we'll, we'll set that aside. Um, this leak truly was unprecedented. Uh, I mean, we've had leaks of decisions before, a day or two before they're announced. Roe v. Wade itself was leaked to Time Magazine, I believe, a couple of days early. But this was an early draft, a complete early draft, before it's ready to go. Um, you know, unclear who, or to this day it's unclear who it is or why they did it, uh, presumably to either create pressure against some justice or just to uh, uh, create chaos in, in society. And, and they succeeded with demonstrations in front of the justices' homes and, and things like that. Uh, but uh, we've, we've learned uh, from uh, the remarks of several justices that it really was a tense environment at the court these last few months uh, since the leak. Nobody can trust each other, the justices meaning, uh, and, um, you know, uh, much stricter control of information and documents uh, after that. Uh, this really inhibits the, the normal functioning of, a, of this vital institution. Once that ruling came out, regardless of how people feel about abortion and abortion policy, what was your sense of the ruling and, and what it said? Well, uh, I wonder whether the reaction was a little more muted than it would have been otherwise because we already had the reaction from the, from the draft, um, whether some of the steam had been let out already. Um, it, it surprised me how little the draft changed from the one that was leaked to the, the final one. I mean, Alito responded to the dissents and the concurrence, of course, um, uh, but otherwise did not accept the, the Wikipedia edits that legal academics were, were suggesting. Um, it's about one, what one would have expected after oral argument. Uh, going into oral argument, the conventional wisdom was that that uh, middle compromise course that John Roberts was pushing uh, would be the way that uh, you know he and Kavanaugh and maybe Barrett would, would go along, uh, not overturning Roe. But at oral argument, it became clear that John Roberts was the only one in the room interested in that middle path. And even the advocates on both sides said, look, you have to go fully up or fully down on the Roe and Casey precedents. We saw Justice Thomas also say, hey, now that we've done this, let's go ahead and look at some of the other cases that have to do with this uh, doctrine of substantive due process. What do you think about that? I think uh, there was a lot of uh, alarmism in response to that concurrence. I mean, I agree with his theoretical critique of substantive due process. Um, uh, privileges or immunities, that clause of the 14th Amendment is a much more constitutionally faithful way of finding uh, protections for unenumerated rights. Um, you know, he's, he said, you know, maybe other precedents need to be reevaluated, but realistically speaking, uh, many of those precedents with respect to uh, uh, same-sex marriage, let alone interracial marriage, are, are based on the Equal Protection Clause. Uh, other uh, uh, protections, you know, contraceptives, who wants to ban contraceptives these days? It's not a very popular opinion, so we're not even going to have that kind of legislation or that kind of uh, litigation. So uh, it's kind of a tempest in a teapot, uh, you know, most importantly, Justice Alito's uh, opinion that distinguished abortion from all other types of rights claims uh, gained five votes. So, you know, saying that at a certain point with abortion, unlike everything else under the sun, there is a second life in being that has rights at a certain point, whatever point that is. And that's different than, you know, uh, uh, private sexual relations, drug use, contraceptives, any of the, you know, privacy issues that, that, that we've uh, faced. That was the big opinion, I think, for most people, but not the only big opinion. There were others that had uh, important constitutions. It was a blockbuster term of blockbuster terms. I mean, even without Dobbs, uh, you had a big Second Amendment case, the, the Bruin case, which um, uh, changed the laws in about six states that, that uh, had given uh, to local police officials the final and basically arbitrary say over whether someone could carry uh, a firearm and the the court ruled six to three. The right to keep and bear arms includes the right to bear arms uh, without threatening a, a licensing regime. They didn't say you have to have constitutional carry and everyone can just carry without a permit. 
Uh, and now there'll be follow on uh, litigation as New York and some other states put in uh, other uh, hoops and sort of uh, a resistance to this court's ruling. School choice, big case, Carson versus Macon. I think removing the last federal legal obstacle to school choice programs, it's really becomes a state political issue at this point, but basically saying uh, states don't have to have school choice, whether that's vouchers or tax credits, or as in this case, a tuition assistance program in Maine. But if they do, you have to treat uh, religious schools the same as you do uh, all other ones, because after all, it's it's parents who are making the choice to take their um, their funding uh, uh, to the school, not the state uh, deciding to to fund uh, uh, religion. Uh, and st- staying in the religion realm, the case of the praying coach, Kennedy versus Bremerton, um, where a football coach was was fired for engaging in prayer that was out in public, but he was doing it himself. And the court ultimately said, as long as there's no coercion or discrimination against students or others who were not participating, then uh, it's not an establishment clause problem. Uh, and uh, 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 saying that the the lemon test, uh, which was hard to apply and involved the entanglement of religion with public policy, that that had long ago been abandoned, said Justice Gorsuch. So even though the juice had long ago been squeezed out of the lemon, Kennedy versus Bremerton threw out the rind uh, as well. And uh, we'd be remiss if we didn't talk about, on the very last day of the term, the big administrative law case, West Virginia versus EPA, which, you know, the culture war issues get all the attention, but this case might have the longest uh, lasting and biggest effect on governance in America because uh, it goes beyond EPA regulation of greenhouse gases or climate change. It goes to every agency in the country. And the court said um, when there's a major question or major regulatory initiative, Congress must have spoken clearly to give that kind of awesome power to the agency. The agency doesn't just assume that power. We have scratched the surface because there are some other big rulings as well. One that was of interest in North Carolina, not a big split, eight to one, but the justices decided that North Carolina legislators can intervene in their federal trial over voter ID. What do you think of that one? Well, I think uh, that uh, uh, prevents political shenanigans if an attorney general in a state, and it's not you know, pro-blue state or pro-red state, but in any state, if, if, if an attorney general declines to defend a particular law, um, as happened uh, with DOMA at the federal level a decade ago, for example, uh, there are institutions that are ready to step in and, and make that good faith defense. I think that's ultimately helpful for the adver- adversarial system and for a full presentation of, um, of arguments and, 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 and briefing in uh, often contentious but important Uh, uh, issues of political structure and institutions. Sticking with North Carolina, looking ahead now to the upcoming term that will start in October, we know the justices are going to be taking up the case dealing with North Carolina's redistricting again. Uh, I'm sure that one's on your radar. Are there other big ones that you're also looking at coming up in this new term? Yeah, the the Moore versus Harper case uh, uh, looks at a state uh, independent state legislature uh, doctrine, and I, I wish the court had taken the case out of Pennsylvania in the in the wake of the election, because uh, you don't want to be doing this while an election is being fought. But it comes up again and again when state courts rewrite the rules that state legislatures pass for elections. Does that sound in federal constitutional law? I'm not sure because the court, the Supreme Court, uh, stayed out of partisan gerrymandering battles. Uh, what will it do now with, you know, famously uh, in, in Pennsylvania with the 2020 election, the state court allowed the counting of ballots that uh, weren't properly uh, uh, dated and signed and, and things like this. Uh, is there redress in federal court for that kind of alleged violation of, of state law? It's an important issue, and I'm glad the court will finally be resolving it. And as I said, not during the heat of a presidential election. And we've got another uh, North Carolina-related case, too. This is one that involves University of North Carolina and also Harvard and the challenge to admissions, uh, looking at a almost 20-year-old now precedent uh, on, on how race can be used in admissions. What do you think about those cases? Yeah, our, our friend Jim Copeland, my now colleague at Manhattan, who went to UNC for undergrad, likes to call the school the Harvard of the South. Uh, that might be apt here, although I'm sure he wouldn't want it compared for this purpose, which is the use of race in, in admissions. Um, I think they added the UNC case just to make sure that there was a public school involved because all the previous uh, jurisprudence regarding affirmative action uh, in, in, in educational admissions has involved public schools. Uh, University of California 
um, uh, Davis in the Baki case, 1979, that started the use of race for on diversity grounds. Uh, and then the, uh, the Grutter and Gratz cases out of Michigan, uh, the Fisher case, UT Austin, and now we have both Harvard and UNC. Uh, and I think here, uh, I'm, you know, I'm willing to make a pretty good bet that the court will inter the uh, failed experiment in allowing schools to, to use race because a school like Harvard, it's a black box. You don't know how they're using it or, uh, you know, it seems statistical, statistically speaking that it's a determinative factor, which the court has said again and again uh, is, not, uh, is, is not allowed. Uh, and um, this is one issue on which even John Roberts, who's now the sixth vote, he's no longer the median justice, Kavanaugh is, uh, but even John Roberts uh, has said you know, 15 years ago in a busing case, the way to stop racial discrimination is to stop discriminating based on race. So that will certainly be uh, create a lot of, of headlines and a lot of uh, agita uh, next year at this time. Um, uh, uh, so the, the court is not uh, shying away after this blockbuster term in, in creating even more news. And another case on the docket for next term, uh, uh, similarly high profile, 303 Creative, involving a website designer who is being compelled to create a site for uh, a same-sex uh, wedding that um, is against uh, her religious beliefs. Um, unlike the the masterpiece cake shop, there's no question of whether you know baking a cake is First Amendment protected speech. Here, it's website design, so that's not an issue. It's simply uh, this this intersection of compelled speech and uh, anti discrimination law. So I have to ask you because there will be plenty of other cases we could go on and on about it, but I have to ask you about a change now in the court's composition. We've seen. Judge Breyer, Justice Breyer on the court now for decades. He's leaving. We have now uh, Katanji Brown Jackson as the newest justice. How does a new justice sort of change the way the court operates? The late Justice Byron White liked to say that every new justice makes for a new court. And I think that's right in terms of their internal dynamics. You know, Breyer was very collegial. Uh, and maybe you know brought out a you know moderate strains in certain opinions in certain cases uh, over the years was also an administrative law uh, expert. Um, uh, just now, Justice Jackson uh, did not serve that long on the Court of Appeals on the D.C. Circuit. She was mostly a, a district judge in her judicial career, so isn't known uh, hasn't hasn't staked out uh, an area of uh, focus in in her jurisprudence. So we'll see what that is. Just in terms of the vote counting, going to be very similar to, to Justice Breyer. Uh, maybe a little to the left of him on criminal justice issues, perhaps, but won't immediately change the way that the court starts uh, deciding uh, uh, certain types of issues. Well, we know that you're going to be following the court as it re returns to work in October. If people want to keep up with uh, what you're doing, now that you do, as you mentioned earlier, have this new uh, perch, tell us tell us how people can find your work. Yeah, I'm building out constitutional studies at the Manhattan Institute, uh, which doesn't require me to move to Manhattan. I'm still, I, I like to joke, I'm heading up. Uh, our Falls Church office where I live in Virginia, um, and building out the amicus program and commentary and, and supporting the, the, the work that my colleagues do. I've also launched the new Substack digital newsletter, Shapiro's Gavel. Uh, you can look there for things that I won't necessarily be writing in the pages of the Wall Street Journal or Newsweek, what have you. Uh, recently, I documented my, my vacation to Sicily and, in fact, titled one post, Reading Dobbs in Palermo. So I commend that to you. My book on uh, Supreme Disorder, Judicial po uh, Nominations in the Politics of America's Highest Court, just came out with an updated paperback edition. So updated for the confirmations of Justice Jackson and Justice Barrett uh, and other developments. Corrected some typos that were in the hardcover as well. So you're welcome to, to pick that up. And uh, I'm tweeting at I Shapiro. So not hard to find me out there, um, you know, wherever uh, finer and not so fine commentary on constitutional laws is found. 